Without further ado, I will introduce our speaker today, Doug Tallamy, whose title of the talk is The Case Against Novel Ecosystems. Doug Tallamy is professor and chair of the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology and director of the Center for Managed Ecosystems at the University of Delaware in Newark, Delaware, where he has authored 78 research articles and has taught insect taxonomy, mineral ecology, and other courses for 31 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His book, Bringing Nature Home, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife in Our Gardens, was published by Timber Press in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. So thank you so much for being here and take it away. All right, thanks a lot, Molly. Just, just to update, I am no longer chair of the department. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay, um, great. Yeah, the, what was it, 13 years enough. Okay, um, the, everybody see this Quetzal in front of me, resplendent Quetzal? Birders around the world will will uh, recognize this as um, as the resplendent Quetzal that's an endangered species in Central America. And it's endangered because it has a very specialized uh, diet. It, it relies largely on the fruits of avocado trees, and unfortunately, we have cut down most of the avocado trees. So if we want to save the quetzal, we have to plant new avocado trees so it has something to eat. Uh, and this, this uh, scenario of, about diet specialization follows conservation efforts around the world. If we want to save the great green macaw, uh, we need to plant the uh, mountain almond trees. Uh, not only does it provide food for them, but it's the only place they will, they will nest. And again, we've cut down most of the mountain almond trees. If we want to save jaguars, uh, then believe it or not, we have to plant a particular species of palm. Um, we have to plant a particular species of palm because they make a particular type of palm nut, and that happens to be the favorite fruit or favorite food for peccaries. And that, of course, is what the jaguars eat. Um, so it's difficult to see the direct connection between the palm and the jaguar, but it is definitely there. So diet specialization in the natural world is is the rule rather than the exception, um, and it always starts with plants. Now most people think that that specialization of all types is uh, much more common in the tropics that we don't see too much of it in the temperate zone. Um, but in fact, particularly in terms of diet specialization, we see a great deal in the temperate zone. This is a great example that you can find right in your yard. This is uh, one of the species of bola spiders. You can see why it's called the bola spiders spider because of the way it hunts with a single strand of silk, a little glob of glue at the end. Um, and it raises that up and down as if it were fishing, uh, trying to attract a particular species of moth. What's interesting about the bola spider is that um, each species of bola spider only feeds on one species of moth. Uh, and believe it or not, that species of moth actually will fly in and get tangled up in that single glob of bola. And that's because the spider is emitting a, a sex pheromone that attracts the males of that, that moth. So if you have that moth in your yard, you can have that bola spider, uh, but you won't have the bola spider or the moth in your yard if you don't have the host plant that the moth depends on as a larva, the larval host plant. So again, it's tied directly to the plants in, in a particular area. Um, a lot of people have flocks to varicata in their, their yards, uh, and it seeds in very well if it is pollinated. Uh, but look at that little corolla. It's a very tiny hole in the center of the flower. And believe it or not, uh, bees cannot pollinate this flower. They can't get their tongues down in that little hole. Um, so what does? It turns out it is day-flying sphinx moths. You can see the tongue extended in, in front of this sphinx moth here. It's going to stick it down in that flower. And it's covered with pollen. And that's how these flowers get pollinated. But you won't have the day-flying sphinx moth if you don't have the larval host plant, which in this case is native viburnum. Again, back to the back to the plants in your yard. There we there we have viburnum dentatum. Um, now even animals we don't think of as specialists really do have specialized relationships with plants. So animals like like the Carolina chickadee. Carolina chickadee, everybody knows, eats seeds. But of course they are eating seeds during the winter time, uh, particularly from our feeders. But during the summer, during the spring, when they're reproducing, they're not seed eaters. They switch to caterpillars. 
Now they could eat grasshoppers, they could eat crickets, they could eat a cannelinid bugs, they could eat serpent flies and snipe flies and cicadellid leaf hoppers and click beetles and tree hoppers or sow bugs or centipedes or millipedes or spiders. All of those things are available for the chickadee when it's reproducing, but they don't. They focus only on caterpillars when they're rearing young. Um, so if you don't have enough caterpillars in your landscape, you are not going to have uh, chickadees, or at least you're not going to have breeding chickadees. What is enough caterpillars? That's a good question. Well, it turns out that chickadees, uh, both the male and the female, forage and supply caterpillars to the nest, which means they can bring a caterpillar in about once every three minutes. Uh, in one 27-minute period in my, my uh, backyard, I was following a pair of chickadees. They brought in 30 caterpillars. They can do that because they often bring in more than one at a time, sometimes a whole bunch at a time. And they do that from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. If we go to the book and we look up how many caterpillars that means each day that they're bringing into the nest, it's between 390 and 570. And they do that between 16 and 18 days. That's how long it takes to, to fledge a group of young, um, which means they're bringing back between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to the nest. That's to rear one clutch of chickadees, and chickadees are tiny birds, a third of an ounce, which I think is four pennies. Mm -hmm. So what would it take? How many, how many caterpillars would it take to, to make a red-bellied woodpecker, for example, that is eight times bigger than a chickadee? The point here is, is that it takes a lot of caterpillars to have viable food webs. And of course, we don't, we don't want just chickadees and, and uh, red-bellied woodpeckers. We want tit mice, and we want yellow-throat uh, warblers and bluebirds and, and peewees and all kinds of other birds in our ecosystem. So we have to have a tremendous number of, of caterpillars out there. All right, what types of landscapers are, escapes are capable of producing um, such large insect numbers? Uh, well, we can't answer that question till we till we uh, understand the very specialized dietary relationships that insects have with the plants that support them. It turns out that 90% of all the insect herbivores uh, on this planet are host plant specialists, which means they are they are um, relying on um, one or just a few lineages of plants for their growth and development. Now, why do insects have to specialize in, in order to eat? Um, they have to do that because plants don't want to be eaten. Plants um, want to gather energy from the sun, use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they load their tissues with, with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make the tissues either, either bitter or downright toxic. Let's use eastern red cedar as an example. Um, it defends its tissues with beta thuyaplixin, which is a, uh, it's a toxic monoterpene. And most insects uh, are not adapted to eating mono, toxic monoterpenes, so uh, they can't eat eastern red cedar. But one that can is the juniper hair streak. Um, it has all the adaptations it needs to get around the, the chemical defenses of eastern red cedar. And that's the upside of specializing. Another upside of specializing is that uh, it, if you're going to eat eastern red cedar, you might as well look like eastern red cedar. Uh, I don't, can anybody see my arrow in here? Mm -hmm. There's a caterpillar right here and another species right here. So it's very easy to blend in to with these. these uh, it's not easy, but they have the adaptations of, of blending in with the thing that they have specialized on. Now, the problem with specializing is that um, once you've developed the adaptations for a particular lineage of plant, you don't have them for a different lineage of plant, which means specialists become locked in to the, the group of plants that they have specialized on, which means if you don't have those plants in your environment, you don't have a specialist. And this brings us to novel ecosystems. And, you know, novel ecosystems are, are uh, groups of plants and animals that have never interacted evolutionarily in the past. And what we're doing is, is um, by moving plants and animals all over the world, we are building novel ecosystems out of a hodgepodge of plants um, that have no evolutionary history with our local insects. And when we do that, we risk losing those specialists, that 90% of our insect herbivores from our ecosystems. Well, who cares if we lose our, our insect herbivores? Um, it turns out that all the things that eat insects uh, care, and that's a lot of things. Um, so if we take insects out of our food webs, the food webs collapse. All spiders eat insects, or they eat other spiders that ate insects. 
there's a tremendous diversity of insect predators out there that are eating insects. They would all disappear. Our frogs and our toads, and, and as a matter of fact, all of our amphibians eat insects. Even our freshwater fish, um, up to 60% of the protein that drives freshwater fish populations is coming from terrestrial insects that fall into these freshwater fish habitats. Lizards eat insects, our bats eat insects, even our rodents eat insects. Uh, now we think of rodents as seed eaters, and they do eat seeds when they when they can't find enough insects. But the reason they're they're eating insects, all of these things are eating insects, is that they are such good food. Pound for pound, there's twice as much protein in insect meat as there is in beef. And insects have organs in their abdomen called fat bodies that are high in lipids that allow these small organisms to grow quickly and reproduce quickly, which if you're a mouse, you, you want to do because uh, there's so many things that want to eat you. But uh, it, the fact that insects are such good food is why larger organisms are eating them as well. The skunk is digging up your yard to get, get uh, grubs that are in your lawn. Possums eat a lot of insects. And even things we don't think of as insectivores eat a lot of insects. Like the red fox, 25% of its diet is insects. Or the black bear, 23% of its diet is insects. Um, so nearly a quarter of the diet of these, these uh, larger predators uh, are actually those small insects. And then things that don't eat insects, like sharp shin hawks, uh, still rely on, on insects in their food web. Sharp shin hawk is, is eating other birds, but the birds that it's eating needed insects to become birds. As a matter of fact, 96% of our terrestrial birds in North America are rearing their young on insects, um, or the book will tell you other arthropods. And those other arthropods are the spiders, for the most part, that needed insects to become spiders. So it's 96% of our birds are relying on insect protein uh, to reproduce, which is news to a lot of people because we're so used to thinking of those birds as eating seeds and berries. Uh, they do, but not when they're reproducing. So what types of landscapes can sustain uh, the complex food webs that we need them to sustain? Um, landscapes that are, are uh, filled with uh, diversity uh, and, and abundance of uh, productive plants. Now I say productive plants instead of native plants um, because not all native plants are that productive. All productive plants are native, but, but we do have uh, a, a number of native plants that are not that productive. So the ones that are driving uh, the food webs that we need are those, those productive plants, and the diversity is always best. We're also looking for landscapes that are rich in co-evolved relationships. That specialization I just talked about, and of course that's only going to happen when you have uh, those plants that are native to a particular area that have been there long enough to develop those co-evolved relationships. And then finally, we want a landscape that includes our most productive plants. Um, so again, this is, this is news to a lot of people that, that uh, plants differ widely in their ability to support food webs. Um, our research has shown that in the mid-Atlantic states, oaks are number one, the genus Quercus, in terms of producing the things that birds need most, those caterpillars. There are 557 species of caterpillars recorded on oaks. Um, compared to ginkgo, for example, a, you know, ornamental plant from China, only five species recorded eating it, and I've never seen one of them. Um, so they're certainly not very common out there. Number two on our list is uh, our native prunus. Things like black cherry support 456 species of caterpillars compared to something like Zolkova, which is a common street tree these days, that supports absolutely no caterpillars. So why do we care if our landscapes are, are sustaining the biodiversity that is out there. Um, well, it turns out that biodiversity is what is creating the ecosystem services that keep humans around. So there's a, there's a direct relationship between diverse functional ecosystems and uh, human well-being. A number of long-term studies are coming due uh, now, and they're all saying the same thing, that as you increase the number of species in an ecosystem, ecosystem function goes up, uh, and vice versa, as you remove species from an ecosystem, ecosystem function goes down. An ecosystem function can be measured in lots of ways, but the production of ecosystem services is one of them. And the Millennial Ecosystem Assessment that came out in 2005 concluded that we have already degraded the, the Earth's ability to produce ecosystem services by 60%, which means we better be building diverse, uh, biodiverse, rich ecosystems as fast as possible instead of constantly tearing them down. So if we want to, to uh, have viable food webs in uh, either managed ecosystems, 
or unmanaged ecosystems. We don't want to load those ecosystems with plants that don't have the, the, the uh, evolutionary history required to develop the specialized relationships that support the food webs. We need to have landscapes that are uh, much richer in native plants that do have those relationships. Now, what about those, uh, all of those non-native plants that are producing the berries that everybody says are, are uh, great for the birds? The birds love these berries. The plants like uh, bush honeysuckle, and these, of course, are all uh, highly invasive, um, or uh, autumn olive, or um, burning bush, or privet, or barberry, or buckthorn. All of these guys are berry producers, and the birds do eat those berries. But remember, birds are not reproducing when they're when they're eating berries. The berries come way after reproduction. So I don't care how many berries are out there, even if the birds love them, even if they're great for the birds, and that's debatable, um, what you need to have the birds to begin with is reproduction. And that's happening with the plants that make the insects that these birds need. And when you get an invasion of barberry or something else, you're eliminating those plants. Um, so that's another reason that novel ecosystems are not such a good deal. So uh, even though there are calls for us to start embracing novel ecosystems, we're stuck with them. That's all we have. So let's let's do the best we can. Um, I think we should still continue to discourage their creation, not because it's going to maintain uh, or, or give us a sense of place. I mean, that's great, but but uh, that's emotional and, and that's not going to carry the day. It's not because natives are prettier. We have beautiful plants from all over the world. Um, so that's not a strong argument. It's not because we're nostalgic for the past. I've been accused of that, that, that uh, you know, we only, we only want to restore uh, native ecosystems because we love the past or because we oppose change. Um, and it's not because we dislike foreigners. I've even been accused of that. That's nativism. Um, it's none of those things. The reason we, we need native plant communities is because we need ecosystem function, and that's not debatable. We're not going to get this ecosystem function without the species that interact with each other. So um, native plants really are the foundation of terrestrial food webs. And they, because of that, they can become powerful conservation tools. I'm going to leave you with, with one story um, that I recently learned about in, in uh, southern Florida. This is the Itala butterfly. It's a little Lycaenid butterfly that only occurs at the tip of, of Florida. Um, it's beautiful, as you, you can see, as both an adult as in a larva. And uh, like uh, the, the insects I've just been talking about, it is a specialist that only eats kunti, which is a native cycad. Now, kunti has an interesting history in that uh, its roots were used by the Seminoles as a source of starch. And when, when settlers came to southern Florida, the Seminoles taught them how to use kunti roots as a source of starch. Settlers loved it, and they ate all the kunti. So Kunti was, was uh, eliminated from ecosystems in southern Florida. There were a few plants remaining in gardens, but it was gone, which meant that the, uh, the Atala butterfly disappeared. It lost its host plant. When we came up with the Endangered Species Act in 1974, I think it was, uh, there were attempts to list the Atala as, as an endangered species so we could get some, some um, conservation money to save it. But nobody could find any Italis, so instead they got it listed as being extinct. Well, about that time, the landscaping industry discovered Kunti as a viable landscape plant. It's a low-growing evergreen shrub that does well in the sandy soils of, of South Florida. So they started to, to put it in residential neighborhoods all over South Florida. Um, and all of a sudden, it was a, it was a common plant again, it, not in the wild, but in residential landscapes. And lo and behold, the, the Itala butterfly showed up again. Nobody knows where it came from. There could have been a remnant population uh, deep in the Everglades, but nevertheless, there it was. What's interesting to me about this story is that it, it truly happened uh, by accident. Uh, they never did get it listed as an endangered species, and not one dime of conservation money was spent on saving it. But by changing uh, one aspect of residential landscapes, uh, the people of South Florida were able, able to, to bring the Italas back from the edge of extinction. Um, so if we can do that with, without trying, imagine what we could do uh, if we actually did try and make conservation the goal of our, our managed ecosystems. So the message here is, is simple, that we can save nature if we embrace the specialized relationships that are nature. And they always start with native plants. And that is all I have. <laughs>